Welcome to the world of tomorrow. Climb aboard. You are about to take a journey out of this world into the world of the future. Forget the world around you. Forget the people around you. You are entering Futurama alone with your own thoughts. Have you ever wondered where we will find the food, clothing, and shelter we will need to sustain the world's exploding population in the years ahead? In the timeless distances of outer space, perhaps? The technology of today is already helping us penetrate the silent darkness of space. Man himself has taken the first tiny step into this vast unknown, and we can only imagine what resources will soon be brought back to Earth by these early pioneers. But what about our own Earth? Are there not still resources here to meet the needs of the world tomorrow? What about that great unexplored continent at the bottom of our Earth, larger than the United States and Europe combined? Already, Antarctica has become a great scientific laboratory for men of all nations to discover great new land areas rich with natural resources. Antarctica is but one area of great promise for the future. What about the others? What about the sea? We have long sailed its surface and fished its depth. But at the very bottom is a land of undreamed of abundance, with enough food to feed the Earth's population seven times over. There are rich ores and minerals carried by submarine trains to process stations on the coast. There is the water itself to be drained from the sea and made fresh as rain to turn desert lands into fertile land. There will even be new areas for living and working, a whole new dimension of life for people of the future. Now, consider the thick, lush lands of the equator. Here, nature flourishes in its greatest abundance. Technology has finally led the way into the wild profusion of the jungle world. One day, this land will be transformed into land for farms and pastures for cattle. From the abundance of equatorial jungles to the barrenness of great mountain ranges, the future offers great promise. Once barriers to man's progress, the mountains will soon be traversed by multiple highways that will soar over canyons and cut through towering walls of granite. They will carry a life stream of minerals and other natural resources to the thriving industries of tomorrow. Highways, too, will open up the great expanses of desert lands, one day to be made fertile again by waters pumped from sea and river, from dam and mountain stream. The highways from great new centers of agriculture and industry will lead inevitably to the metropolis of tomorrow, Access will be easy to the heart of the city, the core. In and around great cities like this will live many of the people of the future, a future of limitless hope and promise. And nowhere will this be more evident to the homemaker than in the kitchen of the future. Remember the ultra-modern home exhibit you visited earlier today? The wonderful new concepts you saw in the kitchen? Yes, I couldn't believe it. That's certainly understandable. It's hard to believe there actually is an oven that can cook a roast in minutes by electronics, then bake you potatoes in less time than it takes to carve the roast. And remember that new idea for the family that enjoys casual living. A refrigerated cart, ready for wheeling into a game room or out onto the patio. Perfect for keeping foods and drinks cool for informal entertaining. Yes, that's a wonderful idea. Now let's continue our journey into imaginative design and new concepts from the far corners of the world. <laughs> Just 
like being on the Mediterranean. Good heavens, I really am. How wonderful. Um, yummy. Fresh foods, too. My goodness, how can so much frozen food fit into such a small space? And no frost, either. this dishwasher holds. Well, I must say, I certainly am getting around. Now I seem to be in the exotic east. Sure, use a good cup of tea about now. My, what a beautiful kitchen! Over here, a laundry center. How convenient. And I'll bet this washer will get anything clean. Even my most delicate things. simple these controls are. <laughs> it happened again. And now I'm in the Orient. Well, look at that. A second oven. How wonderful. Just pull it out for easy cleaning. I like. Lots of refrigerator space and fast food, too. smells good over here. Ah, I'll have to sample that. Ooh, that's hot.
stay. My family will never believe me. Hey, Mom, is dinner ready? Coming right up. How does it look? Delicious. Hi, Dad. Hi. Hmm, looks good. Well, I'll start the car. And you can tell us about going back to the World's Fair today. Did you have fun? I sure did. Everything I saw was out of this world. You're watching Sleepcore, Pleasant Dreams. This is the story of a search, a search for beauty. In this search, men first drew inspiration from the forms of nature. In Egypt, the papyrus plant formed the motif in the fluting of architectural columns. In the maiden's gown, in the alabaster vase, in the styling of chariots, the ancestors, all fleet and beautiful things on wheels. The finest wheel vehicles were styled for elegance and were made by hand for the fortunate few. Then came an innovation that was a turning point in history. No one cared that the automobile looked like the familiar buggy minus the horse. People were more concerned with whether it was safe and how well it would work. Automobiles continued to look like carriages and much the same lines were used year after year. Then motor cars became a means of mass transportation with steel bodies that could be reproduced in the millions. Late in the 1920s, the Model A replaced the Model T. Here was the beginning of a new motor age the styling of a mass-produced car so that it would be more pleasing to the eye. As engineers worked to improve the mechanism, stylists worked to improve the appearance. In those formative years, the concept of the modern car was born. As the work of the stylist became an organized search for beauty. One concept led to the elegance and dignity of the Continental. Unto the swift and distinctive lines of the Thunderbird. The principles of beauty to an automobile. Like the painters and sculptors who preceded him for centuries, he draws inspiration and ideas from the life, the forms, and the art of the world. Shape. Proportion. Ornamentation. Material. Texture. Color. 
function, pattern, space, and rhythm so that the automobile he designs will be both functional and beautiful. He explores the dynamics of motion, both mechanical and human. Or as he learned when he was a student, if you can draw the subtlety of the human figure, you can draw anything. Just as a sculptor may express strength and repose, the stylist must express form that relates to motion. He blends all these elements for the final effect of harmony, order, and interest. The contemporary stylist is part artist, part architect, part sculptor, and part product designer. Like Leonardo da Vinci, the stylist unites art and technology. Leonardo, master of the Renaissance, approached art as a science and science as an art. Leonardo's spring-driven automobile has something in common with this dream car conceived in an advanced styling studio. Both are far ahead of the time in which they were created. Today's dream cars are a source of inspiration for the stylists. Some are working on ideas for the distant future. Others are concerned with features that may be used in the next few years. In attacking a design problem, the stylist must think first of the vehicle's occupants. Safety and comfort, along with beauty, are of basic importance. He explores many directions. Finally, the best features coalesce into the design that is approved for the next stage. Expression in three dimensions. To this wooden armature, clay is applied. It is shaped for a sculptured version of a new model. After many refinements, the first three-dimensional model is ready for management appraisal. Here is Allegro, an experimental car that could be called a practical dream car. It is designed with a long hood, a grill that extends forward of the headlights, a compact passenger compartment, and a fast back roof line. Other advances include brake and accelerator pedals, which adjust to fit the driver. Here is a new concept in driver convenience, a unique cantilevered arm steering wheel with a memory unit. By pushing buttons, the driver can raise or lower the steering wheel and move it fore or aft to his most comfortable driving position. When he leaves, he swings the steering wheel out of the way for easy exit. On re-entering the car, he merely touches the memory button to move the steering wheel back to the original driving position. This is Cougar II, another practical dream car. It's a two-passenger GT or Gran Turismo. Function is the keynote of the interior design. The leather seats adjust individually. Instrumentation is complete and clearly legible. Controls are located for optimum convenience, and the carpeting enhances soundproofing as much as appearance. The Cougar II has a fast back roof, concealed pop-up headlamps, and is powered by a high-performance V8 engine. It could be engineered for speeds in the 170 mile per hour range. 
And now, Aurora, designed for the whole family to enjoy. A bank of 12 one-inch headlights is a new approach to road illumination. Electroluminescent side panels increase visibility for nighttime safety. It has a clamshell rear entry system, which consists of a tailgate that folds down and a lift gate that slides over the roof to permit easy access to the children's seat. The front passenger can face forward or swivel the armchair seat. The curved sofa is large enough for three adults. This experimental station wagon is equipped with a thermoelectric combination oven refrigerator unit and a built-in beverage cooler and cabinet. It also has three separate AM FM radios, a sound recorder and a plug-in TV screen. The advanced instrument panel incorporates a position indicator map that automatically adjusts to the location of the car. A lane speed panel for expressway driving. A large speedometer with individually illuminated numerals to highlight vehicle speed and a constant speed control device. With variable ratio steering, the steering bar requires only one half turn from lock to lock sits in a contoured cockpit seat with a high back for support. Will any of these experimental features be seen on production cars in the future? The public will decide. Experimental cars are displayed at places such as the World's Fair to evoke consumer action. When many opinions are evaluated, the features consumers like... As the search for beauty continues, the stylist focuses on the future that lies just ahead. Years ago, custom-built horseless carriages reflected the tastes of the very wealthy. Today, the lowest price cars provide attractive and tasteful interiors. And stylists are working on many ways to make them even more comfortable and more exciting in years to come. To please a very style-conscious public, the interior designer evaluates thousands of fabrics before making a selection. But the search for beauty must be more than surface deep, and the stylist is as concerned with function as he is with form. By definition, a stylist is one who advises concerning current styles, as in dress and furnishings. Today, the term is automotive industry to differentiate between the designer of the vehicle's appearance and the designer of the mechanical parts and structure. Obviously, these creative processes overlap. Like his predecessors, the stylist, by inclination, skill, and training, is predominantly an artist. Yet, in order to exercise his art, he must have a working knowledge of engineering, of the properties of many materials, and of costs and sources of supply. Thus, he is an industrial designer who applies total performance of vehicles. Sometimes the stylist's experimental car can be moved almost without change to the assembly line. Such a car 
was Mustang II. What gives this car its look of total performance? First, inside. An interior that's inviting, comfortable, and sporty. With an instrument panel that's deeply padded and hooded. Now, outside. The unique grill, long hood, low top, and short rear deck. Sculptured side panels to lower the profile. Round wheel openings to emphasize the wheels and suggest power and performance. This is the moment of truth, the production car. The work of the stylist, begun over 20 months ago, has been translated into fabric, rubber, glass, and metal. Now the public will tell him how well he has succeeded. The story of styling ends here, but the stylist will turn again to his practical dreams. The search for beauty never ends. You're watching Sleepcore, media for insomnia.
Here is a world of communication, tailored for your needs of today and tomorrow, bringing together all people in a new era of understanding. Keeping in touch by means of the amazing new Bell Boy is the Bell System's answer today for doctors, salesmen, delivery men, or anyone who must be available at all times in the fast-paced world of Century 21. When someone calls and you are out, you can be reached by dialing your Bell Boy code number. When you get a signal on the Bell Boy, you can go to a phone to call your officer home and get the message. This is the automatic dialer. Just listen for dial tone, insert a number card, and press the start bar. The Bell System automatic dialer dials for you more quickly and easily than you can do it yourself. Numbers you call frequently can be punched on small plastic cards. Pick a city. Then see how fast direct distance dialing really is. Dial the area code, then the weather report telephone number. Presto, instant weather. With DDD, most calls go through in 20 seconds or less. Here you see the Bell solar battery in action, turning light into electricity to run this display. Solar batteries are used to convert sunlight to electrical power and make our satellites talk back from outer space. Hi, this is the Bell System's new touch tone dialing. With this indicator, you see how many seconds you save the new way. Let's try it. Okay, I'll race you. Ready? Go. I beat you. Welcome to our exhibit. I'm glad to have this opportunity to tell you about the telephone switching center of tomorrow. The electronic central office, which is made possible by the magic of the transistor and other tiny but amazing devices invented by the Bell Telephone Laboratory. Imagine, if you can, an electronic brain operating at millionths of a second speed. I say brain because the new electronic central office will almost think for itself. It will not only carry out instructions you dial into it, it will also remember instructions you provided earlier. These memory features will offer many convenient services I'm sure you'll be delighted with. For one thing, you'll be able to reach frequently called numbers by dialing only two digits. All you'll have to do is give the telephone company a list of the numbers you dial most frequently. The electronic brain's memory will do the rest. To see how it works, please watch the screen. Now, let's see. All right. Now, let's say you want to call your mother, who lives in Des Moines. You call her fairly often, so the telephone company has assigned 53 as your special number for making this call. When you dial the 5 and the 3, the electronic central office's brain says, uh-oh, something special. Searches its memory for what those two digits represent. And dials the area code plus the full number in Des Moines for you. Hello? Hello, Grandma! Ever been invited out for an evening and had to turn it down because you're expecting an extra special call? Well, the electronic central office will solve that problem for you, too. When you do go out, it will be a simple matter to have your calls transferred. All you'll have to do is dial a special code, which tells the equipment's brain you want your calls transferred, and then dial the telephone number where you can be reached. Our amazing electronic central office will take it from there. I think it's a wonderful call for you. No, no, you stay. Hello? Diane? No, this isn't Diane. It's Linda. Linda? <laughs> what gives? This is Jim Morton. I was calling Diane Brown. Oh, yes, she's here. She had her calls transferred to my house. Hi, Jim. And what about those times someone has tried to call you and your line is busy? We've thought of that, too. Oh, 
fine, Sarah, that's fine. I'll have the information for you at the meeting next Wednesday. When you hear the beep tone on your telephone, you know someone else is trying to reach you. Sarah, will you hold on just a minute? Someone else is trying to reach me. All you do is flick the switch hook to hold the first call while you hello? take the second. Oh, hello, dear. I was just talking to Sarah. I see. Okay, dear, would you tell Fred next time he's in town, he's to bring Helen, right? Bye, dear. You flick the button back and go on with your first call. Hello, Sarah. That was Bert calling. Easy as pie, isn't it? And here's another feature you're going to find handy. Now, look. Sarah, Jane knows a lot more about that than I do. Why don't we get her on the line and find out? Okay, just a minute. Want someone else on the line? That's easy, too. Flip the switch button, then dial a code number and the number you want. And presto. Hello, Jane. This is Martha. This I have Sarah on the line, and we want to know what to do about... As we look to the future, we see many extras for tomorrow's telephone users. One day, you may be able to call home and automatically turn off the oven. Or, from a public telephone a couple of hundred miles away, turn on your home air conditioner and have the house nice and cool when you return from your hot trip. It may even be possible to call and water the lawn during that dry spell when you are many miles away on vacation. Sounds fantastic, doesn't it? But it is all possible because of the basic research our scientists and engineers at the Bell Telephone Laboratories are doing to make your service better day by day. From their work has come breakthrough after breakthrough in science providing the intricate devices that lie at the heart of your telephone service of tomorrow. Through the invention of better things, we are trying very hard to give you the kind of telephone service you want and need. And we think you'll agree, after seeing the many exhibits we have here, there is no end to telephone progress now or in Century 21. You're watching Sleepcore. Sleep tight. What's tomorrow going to be like? What kind of world are we going to live in when we get our permanent furloughs? Super speed highways, plastic packards, streamlined cities. What does the future hold in store for us? To get a glimpse of that future, Army Navy Screen Magazine presents a new department, Tomorrow. 
previewing our post-war world, the job opportunities, the new fields ahead. For the first in our Tomorrow series, let's look into a brand new development, television. Here's an expert with a lowdown on the inside facts, Dr. Orestes Caldwell, editor of Electronic Industries and former member of the Federal Communications Commission. I'm glad to have this opportunity to speak to you men and women in the service of America. I believe in this world to come. I think it's going to be a pretty good world. But I've been asked to tell you about television, so I'll trim the philosophizing. Television is most certainly here to stay. It's going to brighten the world of your home. But more important to many of you, it's going to create a lot of new jobs. Now, none of us like crystal gazing, so let's take a look at what is actually happening now. Nine experimental telecasting studios are already operating with pre-war equipment and skeleton staffs. While the electronic industry is busy finishing its war job, a handful of people, girls, ex-vets, older men, are keeping the television field alive, experimenting, ironing out kinks, but proving that television will definitely be part of American life when the go-ahead comes. Sight teamed up with sound to bring the world to your easy chair. Telecasting studios will be a combination of Broadway and Hollywood and you'll get the best of both for the price of your television set and a few cents worth of electricity. And outside the studios, mobile televising units, portable stations on wheels, are now experimenting with remote pickups, getting primed to bring you on-the-spot news and history in the making. When television networks are formed, you will have a direct wire to every place a television camera can be set up. A world of sports, at your fingertips. They're off. That's interpreter number two right in front. And the field races past the stand with interpreter on top. Low man in second place moving up on the outside. Mayor LaGuardia pitches the first ball. Red Ruffing is taking his time. And it's a hit. There's a capacity crowd here at Madison Square Garden tonight to witness the semifinals of the Golden Glove. Telecasting is done on a limited schedule now. But tomorrow, you will have a permanent ringside seat everywhere from Madison Square Garden to the House of Congress. You'll see transmitted by television, newsreels, and Super Hollywood productions. Plays and musicals command performances in your own living room. These men at Halloran General Hospital, where there are a hundred sets, can tell you television is here to stay. Even now, without the technical improvements that will come after the war, the television picture has the quality of a good home movie. The pre-war models in use today have a small screen, but here's a practical working model with a 16 by 22 inch screen that goes into production just about the time you're being measured for civvies. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. WNBT New York. Well, that gives you a pretty general idea of what's happening. Now let's see how television works. You're going to find a new type of aerial against the skyline of America when you return. It will be up high because television waves, like light rays, don't bend and are stopped by the horizon. So the higher the aerial, the farther the waves travel. But first, what is a television wave? As you know, all objects reflect light, some more, some less, depending on their color. The white jacket of these fencers is reflecting more light than their dark trousers. 
the television camera lens, like an ordinary camera, picks up these differences in light and shadow. Only instead of film behind the lens, we have the iconoscope, familiarly known as Ike. The camera plate of the iconoscope is made up of millions of sensitive electric eyes. These eyes pick up electric impulses from the object being televised and form a picture which is then transmitted as separate electric impulses from the camera plate to the receiver screen. There the impulses are converted back to pinpoints of light and shadow to reform the picture on the screen. Here the process is slowed down for you. Actually, the impulses travel from the camera to the receiving set at the rate of four million impulses a second, forming the picture in motion. Fantastic. But our children will grow up with this miracle enriching their lives and giving them a new understanding of the whole world. Gosh. Yet by harnessing electrons and vacuum tubes, our research scientists, backed by American industry and manufacturing skill, have developed this new means of communication to the point where it promises to become a post-war billion dollar industry which can serve our nation and the world in new and wonderful ways. Let's listen to a man who knows. He is one of the great leaders in the world of electronics, Brigadier General Sarnoff, president of the Radio Corporation of America. When the first world war ended, it was my good fortune and privilege to play a part in the launching and subsequent development of a new industry called broadcasting. There were some who said it had great promise. There were others who said that it was a noisy, sputtering gadget, a passing fancy. The rest, you know. Now let us see what possibilities exist for television once the war ends. Here are the possibilities. In the manufacturing field, 60,000 men and women will be needed to make the first sets, which will retail for about $200, with 18 million Americans ready to buy them. Help wanted. Electronic experts, assemblers, wiremen, machinists, finishers, testing personnel, sheet metal workers, drill press operators, spot welders. Television is just made to order for GIs with radio and radar experience. 85,000 maintenance men are going to be needed to install and service the 30 million sets expected to be sold within the first 10 years of full-scale production. And in the distribution end of the business, 135,000 jobs are going to open up in the new shops and sales organizations that will supply the huge consumer demand. All in all, 300,000 well-paying jobs are expected to be created by television within five years after the new industry really gets rolling. Well, that's a comprehensive view of the industrial picture. Now what about television production? Here's a man who qualifies as an expert on that subject. Meet Mr. Gilbert Seldes, head of production of the Columbia Broadcasting System. They tell me that a great many of you may be interested in jobs in television production. I think you're entitled to the hard, solid facts in the case. As of spring 1945, we are employing 62 people. They work a full week to put on four hours of programs on the air. That doesn't mean four hours a day, it means four hours a week. If we were on the air eight hours a day, seven days a week, we'd need at least seven times as many people in the neighborhood of 500. And we're only one studio. There are 900 radio broadcasting stations in the United States today. And it's anybody's guess how many television stations are going to spring up. We can just be sure that the faster we deliver good entertainment and good pictures, the more jobs we're going to create. And there will be a lot of jobs. You compare television with radio, for instance. Here is a radio newscaster on the air. One man in the studio, one in the control room. And here is a television newscast. And a lot of work went into it before it got this far. Now as for the movies, here is just a medium colossal production underway. Yes, it takes a lot of people and many months to make one. Yet commercial television will probably use more material in one week than all the studios in Hollywood turn out in a year. And finally in the theater, 
You produce a show, it may run for years. In television, every night is opening night and closing night, too. Now let's look at some specific television jobs. Some of them you'll see come from radio, movies, and the theater. Some are new. Here are two men doing a job never heard of before. They are riding the Ike. Shaders and switchers in the control room see that the pictures come out right. At the transmitter, they see that they get out on the air. And electronic experts keep it all functioning. New men with radio and radar training are only a hop, skip, and jump from the industry's need. Then there will be modifications of established professions. Writers, directors, producers, scenic designers, and just to show you wax waves and spars that this isn't exclusively a man's world, there'll be costume designing and stage management. Then behind the scenes, makeup, props, electricians, and almost everything else from carpenters to model makers. But the great thing to remember is that we've just begun to discover the possibilities of television. And these are only a few of the jobs that already exist. Many more are bound to develop as we go on. That's it. Television. And some interesting jobs which some of you may be qualified for. But more than that, television can be the window to the whole world a medium through which the United Nations can better understand each other and live together in the world of tomorrow.